Have you ever been playing in the sand on a sunny day at the beach and wondered, where did all this sand come from in the first place? Colossal Questions! Sand is made from a natural process called erosion, which is when something is slowly worn away by some sort of natural force, like wind, water, or just the wear and tear of animal traffic. Sand is made when rocks are slowly whittled down into tiny little pebble grains. The long, slow process starts all the way up high in the mountains. That's where alpine winds and water first get to work, breaking down massive mountains, tiny little piece by tiny little piece over thousands of years. As rocks chip off mountains or break away into rivers, they make their way slowly downstream, eroding and breaking down into even smaller pieces as the water swirls the rocks around. Eventually, all rivers lead to the ocean, and so do most of our mountain rock particles traveling downstream. As they go, waves, tides, and other stuff in the water keep breaking down those pieces until they become those tiny little rock grains we call sand. Most of us picture beige sand on a beach, but it actually comes in different colors. Tan, pink, white, and even black. The color depends on what kind of rock the sand came from. Tan sand is the most common, and it's made up of a rock called quartz that's been tinted by a chemical called iron oxide and another mineral called feldspar. Iron oxide is another form of what we call rust, which is why the sand gets that orangey, reddish tan tint. Pink sand beaches are a little bit more rare, but you can still find them in beautiful spots around the world, like Bermuda, the Bahamas, Greece, the Philippines, and Indonesia. The pink color comes from tiny single-celled critters called foraminifera that have red shells that tint the sand a pinkish color. These little organisms usually live in coral reefs, which is why pink sand tends to show up in tropical places. White sand beaches are also mostly made up of quartz, but the sand hasn't been tinted by iron oxide or feldspar. Black beaches are probably the rarest type and form near volcanoes. They're formed from eroding lava and basalt rocks that come from volcanic eruptions. Places like Iceland, Hawaii, and Japan are just a few places known for their volcanic black sand beaches. So next time you're at the beach, whether it's a picture-perfect paradise or an overcrowded strip of tan sand, take a minute to appreciate just how long it took for these mighty mountains to be turned into all our beautiful beaches. And even the less beautiful ones, too. Whales are massive, majestic, and well-known for their underwater melodies. But have you ever stopped and wondered why whales do all that singing? Questions. Not all whales sing, just a special group called baleen, which includes blue whales and humpbacks, among others. They're maybe the most well-known underwater singer-songwriter, but they're far from the only aquatic animal that makes noise. In fact, the ocean is pretty loud. Sea creatures are always making songs, screams, clicks, clacks, boops, bops, and all sorts of strange sounds. But none of those noises are even close to as sophisticated and specific as a whale's song. You see, whale songs already sound pretty complicated on the surface, but when you dig in, things get even more complex. You see, whale songs are arranged into elaborate but predictable patterns and phrases that are repeated over and over, no different from a complicated piece of classic music. But instead of different instruments, a whale song is made up of different sounds, like groans, trills, clicks, and cries. Those noises are arranged in phrases, which make up themes that are repeated in a pattern that make up a song. Whale songs don't have a specific ending. Whales can sing them for as long or as little as they feel like. Most whales sing for about 30 minutes at a time, but it can go on for hours and hours. And that's not all. Whales don't just sing the same song forever. Each year, they add, drop, or adjust phrases in their songs, constantly updating them. 
that means whales sing one ever-evolving piece of music over the years. No one really knows for sure why whales sing, but experts do have some solid guesses. Since only male whales sing, it could be a way to attract a mate. But most of the time, it just attracts other male singers, so that might not be why. Others think it might be a way of marking their territory and keeping other males from getting too close. Pods of whales always travel to the same warm spots to breed and cold spots to feed, so it could be part of keeping their area safe. Some today think it has less to do with either and is much more to do with navigating those dark, murky ocean waters. Think of it like echolocation with a melody. You see, light doesn't travel very well underwater, but sound waves actually move about four times faster than they do in the air. So one of the best things for any aquatic animal to communicate, especially across long distances, is by sound rather than sight. Whatever the reason, it's clear that songs are super important to the whale way of life. So why do whales sing? Who knows? Hopefully one day we can finally crack this musical mystery once and for all. Have you ever stopped and wondered to yourself, how do fish breathe underwater? Colossal Questions. Humans, like all mammals, use their lungs to breathe. Two big organs in our chest that look like empty inflated bags. Whenever we breathe in air, it all gets pulled into the lungs, filling them up. The oxygen molecules in the air pass through the lung walls into tiny blood vessels called capillaries. From there, the oxygen travels through the bloodstream on red blood cells all around the body, where it's needed to help replace old cells and provide us with energy. Mammal lungs wouldn't work very well for a fish. Anyone who's ever accidentally tried to take a breath underwater can certainly attest to that. But even so, fish still need oxygen to breathe just like us. So how do they do it? Using special organs on the side of their body called gills. Rather than breathing in and out through their mouth, fish have a one-way flow. They suck in water that's filtered as it passes through the gills on its way out. The little feather-like bristles on the gills each have thousands of tiny blood vessels on them, way more than the human lung. They take in oxygen from the water and move it into the bloodstream. Just like humans and other air breathers can drown underwater, fish with gills can drown in air too. If fish gills spend too long in the air, they'll collapse and suffocate them. Okay, so that's how fish breathe underwater, but what about whales? And what about dolphins? What about all the different marine animals that swim to the surface for air? Well, the answer is actually simpler than you might think. They're not fish at all. They're mammals. They have lungs and breathe air just like us. That's right. These special species are called marine mammals. Whales, dolphins, seals, porpoises, manatees, sea otters, polar bears, and a few other aquatic mammals that rely on the ocean to survive, but also need to breathe air. Some marine mammals spend lots of time on land, like sea otters and polar bears. Others, like seals and sea lions, are semi-aquatic, spending most of their time in the water, but coming up every now and then. It's the fully aquatic marine mammals who need to swim to the surface for a breath, since almost all of their time is otherwise spent underwater. When a whale or dolphin reaches the surface, it breathes in a big gulp of air through its blowhole on the top of its head, which is basically their nostril hole. So the next time you come sputtering up out of the water at your friend's pool party, gasping for breath and spitting out chlorine, just remember, not everyone can have the grace of a dolphin. Have you ever watched the waves crash on the beach and wondered to yourself, how deep are the briny depths? What's the absolute deepest point in the ocean? Colossal Questions. Throughout history, if you wanted to measure just how deep a body of water was, you had to tie a weight to a rope and let it drop to the bottom, then measure how much rope went in the water. Not too hard. But when it comes to the ocean, 
it would take thousands of feet of rope to measure some of the deeper parts. So, for centuries, no one really knew just how deep our oceans are. That is, until the late 1800s, when a British Navy ship named the HMS Challenger set out on a voyage to learn more about the briny deep. The ship was outfitted with over 900,000 feet of hemp rope, more than enough to reach even the deepest, darkest places. During the four-year journey, the crew of the Challenger managed to find the bottom of the ocean, the Mariana Trench. This massive crack in the Pacific Ocean stretches for more than 1,500 miles. Even still, the HMS Challenger found what is maybe the single deepest point, now known as the Challenger Deep on the southern end of the Mariana Trench. Nowadays, experts use high-tech, state-of-the-art sonar technology to precisely map the ocean floor, giving us a much clearer picture of what the trench looks like and exactly how far down the Challenger Deep really goes. 35,856 feet! That's close to seven miles! That's deep! Really, really deep! How deep exactly? Well, the diving limit for recreational scuba divers is 130 feet. That's about the height of a large building. Pretty deep. Blue whales, the biggest known creatures to ever live on Earth, can dive down to more than 1,500 feet, double that depth to 3,000 feet, and sunlight can no longer penetrate the water. The wreck of the Titanic sits on the cold ocean floor, about 12,000 feet underwater. And on average, the Earth's oceans are about 14,000 feet deep. To put those depths into perspective, the tallest skyscraper in New York City is a mere 1,776 feet tall. The absolute deepest shipwreck ever uncovered sits at the bottom of the Philippine Sea, 21,180 feet down. The Atlantic Ocean goes even deeper than that, maxing out at 27,500 feet. For comparison, Mount Everest, the highest place on Earth, is 29,032 feet, just a few thousand feet taller than the Atlantic Ocean is deep. Whoa! But even the mighty Everest can't come close to competing with the Pacific Ocean's Mariana Trench. The Challenger Deep, the deepest known point in the entire ocean, is an amazing 35,856 feet below the waves. Because no light can penetrate that deep, and because the pressure of the water above is so insanely immense, only highly specialized submersibles are able to venture down into Challenger Deep and explore. Down there are some of the most fascinating, strange, and in some cases horrifying creatures on the planet. And the more we explore, the more we find. Then who knows what they'll find next? Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. But why? Have you ever stopped and wondered why all the oceans are salty? Colossal Questions! There are five oceans on our planet. The Pacific Ocean is the biggest, then the Atlantic, Indian, Southern, and Arctic Oceans. Some oceans are saltier than others, but usually around 3.5% of ocean water is salt. You see, the sea floor has huge amounts of minerals that are constantly being swished, swirled, and stirred up by the natural motion of the ocean. This causes tiny amounts of minerals, called salts, to break away from the sea floor and dissolve into the ocean water, making it salty. Lakes, streams, and rivers, on the other hand, aren't salty at all. But why? Why is it just the oceans? Well, it turns out that lakes, streams, and rivers do actually have small amounts of dissolved salt in them, too. It's just a much smaller amount than in the ocean. Salty minerals have a hard time building up in lakes because lakes tend to have rivers and streams that carry away the minerals quickly. The lake can't dissolve as much salt as the streams and rivers can carry away. And guess where all the streams and rivers carry that salty mineral water? To the ocean! 
So, not only does the ocean do a good job of making its own salt water, it also takes in all the salts and minerals from lakes, streams, and rivers around the world. But some lakes don't have rivers and streams to take the salts away. When that happens, you end up with the Dead Sea or the Great Salt Lake, since they have no outlets. The salt slowly builds up in the water with nowhere to go, making the water way more salty than the ocean. The Great Salt Lake can get up to 27% salt, and the Dead Sea can be close to 34%. Remember, the oceans are only 3.5% salt. That's about 10 times saltier than the ocean, which means no aquatic life can survive there except for bacteria. So, whether it's the saltiest lake on Earth or a fresh babbling brook, there's always some salt in the water.